Hi, welcome to Everett Box Guitar Tuition. So my classic album inspection for you today is one of the seminal hard rock albums of all time, ACDC's Highway Hell. Uh, it's 45 years old today, released July 27th, 1979. This is the game changer. This is the album that uh, sent them platinum in the States, uh, bigger in Europe, UK, and set the, the road uh, for them to become one of the, the biggest rock acts, uh, music acts of all time. Sadly, not to be experienced by the great Bond Scott there, singer who sadly died uh, the following year after recording this. Um, so what really changes this album is this pressure on DC, the Power Age album, as amazing as it is and still my favourite DC album, hasn't achieved the commercial success. Uh, so they um, hire Mutt Lang, who's uh, got a good track record with City Boy uh, in terms of production and the Boontown Rats, to come in and add a bit of polish. Um, now, obviously, now we know Mutt Lang to come in with huge sort of drum sounds and uh, massively layered vocals. But at this point, he, he just what he really does is make sure the tuning spot on. All the tempos are spot on. Um, you know, there's, there's issues with a bit of tuning issues, certainly on Let There Be Rock. Um, so the, the guitars sound kind of punchier that way. Um, he gets kind of more precise vocals out of Bon, a little more clarity in his diction. And he does clever things with the backing vocals. He, he kind of layers and he brings in a few more chants and brings in harmonies, but really subtly, he just puts a little bit of polish on. And you can hear how, you know, this is the beginning of how that will develop later on in his career. Another thing he does is he kind of makes the band, or Angus and Malcolm, he does interesting things with the parts and puts extra guitar parts in choruses to punch them up. Uh, and then there's a, um, a just a degree of polish on the songs. It was recorded in the UK, Roundhouse in London, also Criteria in Miami and Albert Studios in Sydney where they did all their early albums. Um, he did Grand Park and the Rumour as well and Clover, Mutt Lang. Um, uh, so what's what's it like? Well, it opens with one of the all-time great rock tracks, Highway to Hell, um, and I think instantly you can hear like how brilliant the guitar sound is, uh, and just that extra edge of performance. You know that riff. Uh, there's a real subtleties to that riff where they kind of play most of the chord and then all the chord later in the riff. Um, it's such a simple idea, but it shows DC's strength. You know, if you're a musician and you know, just try playing that riff on the beat and just see how ordinary it feels. Um, but when you, you play it the DC way, where you've got it one, two, three, da -da -da, and it catches you by surprise, it's just amazing. Um, great track, um, great vocal by Bon. Three minutes twenty nine seconds, and of course it was it was a hit for them. Uh, and it's one, you know, a staple of, of rock radio. Next track's Girls Got Rhythm. Again, this has got a nice commercial hook. Uh, it's got a really cool um, riff, really cool groove to it. Three minutes, 24. Uh, again, you can hear the backing vocals. Like, Girls Got Rhythm, you know. There's a little bit of that gang chant thing. Um, really good track. Uh, Walk All Over You's up next. This is five minutes, 10, bit longer. Again, this has got hauling groove, pounding groove. Um, uh, I think what you notice as well at this point is Angus's solo is a bit short, uh, a bit simpler, um, uh, a little more formed and structured. Um, and that again, that was another thing that Mutt Lang did. He sort of just got Angus to, you know, structure things a little better and that helped. Um, uh, yeah, walk all over, all over you, another great track. Then I think the next track, I think it's my all-time favourite DC track, and although it's a classic amongst fans and it will always be a DC classic, because it doesn't get played live because the vocals are so hard, I feel it's kind of been forgotten about a bit. But this is easily up there with Back in Black and Hell's Bells. Uh, and this was the the song, the second song to get them on top of the pops in the UK. They were on with Rock and Roll Damnation in 78, and that, um, that was like one of the, like, the precursors to the, the dam breaking, as Biff Byford says, and then Touch Too Much was on. Uh, I didn't see it um, uh, back end 79, I guess. Um, no, probably before that. Actually, let's see when it was released as a single. Um, and it was released January in the UK, right, it's 1980, right. So this actually came out, I think, probably just before Bond only filmed his clip on Top of the Pops. Uh, this was the first time I heard the word heavy metal, so my brother said, oh, there's this new music, there's heavy metal, there's this band ACDC and this band Motorhead. And obviously we know that ACDC aren't heavy metal, but 
as people who've you know followed the genre all these years will know, back then your denim jacket could include Rush, Journey, uh, you know DC, Judas Priest, you know Mind Maiden and whatever, and a UFO, uh, Ted Nugent, whatever, and it's it's all part of that thing: hard rock, heavy metal, heavy rock. Um, does touch so much a great track and Angus's solos are so good on this are so simple the first one he just kind of does a kind of cool Chuck Berry thing and his end solo he doesn't play many notes but he just really squeezes the emotion out of it um, then you've got Beating Around the Bush again this is kind of finished with a little deep cut here again a lovely kind of kind of funky cool shuffle riff um, uh, quite stompy uh, again a really, a really cool track um, and that was the end of side one I mean Fucking hell, it's brilliant. Side two opens with an absolute fucking classic DC track, Shot Down in Flames. It's got one of the funniest lyrics of Bob Bon Scott because it's really about him going out and getting uh, rejected. You know, he, he struts over to the jukebox, you know, uh, to get, um, uh, get a lady for the night or get a lady's attention and um, she's not interested. Great, um, you know, again, when the riff comes in, da, 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 you can hear like how the clarity of the tune and intonation on the guitars has been really fine honed. So it's just got like a real precise power. Obviously the groove on this with um, Cliff Williams pumping the eighth notes uh, like he, no one else can. And then Phil Rudd's superb take on the Charlie Watts pocket and brilliant. Then you've got another really deep cut. It's actually one of my, uh, you know, if you had to pick a real deep cut off his own, I really like this track. It's Get It Hot. It's just 2 minutes 35. This is probably my Stonesy number. Really like the sort of Keith Richards style guitar and a nice kind of harmonisation on the guitars. Uh, really like Bond's vocals. Uh, sassy, great. Then if you want Blood, you got it. Uh, another quite interesting, obviously, taking an arm title for this track. And that's an interesting thing. Our title tracks of other albums that are used for titles of other songs, but on other albums, have a think. But um, this is a great track, brilliant. Um, love uh, Bond's lyrics on this. It's really um, kind of, it's kind of uh, taking in what DC do on stage and the struggle of how had up to him. And ACDC have worked insanely hard. Uh, you could probably argue too hard, and that's probably what's cost cost. Uh, certainly Bon possibly in the end of cost people along the way um, just insane amount of gigs insane sacrifice to, to get to, to just to this level to go and to go beyond um, so the album's amazing up until this point then it kind of takes this dip with Love Hungry Man this is the one track on the album and the album's four let me hold, sorry it's 4138. Now, Love Hungry Man is 418, so if they took it off, you'd still have a 37 minute nine track album. Um, I just think this, it's got quite an interesting boom, 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 a little bit disco funky bass line, which would be interesting, but it just hasn't got the hook or the, the verse and bridges don't build really to something substantial. I was listening to it before I was trying, I don't dislike it, but it's just not quite there. Then it finishes with Night Prowler. This is a song that got him into trouble because um, the lyrics are kind of uh, the time in Los Angeles. You have the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. If you um, watch a documentary about him, horrible serial killer who broke into people's houses and murdered them. So this was just too close to the bone. Funny enough, at the end of this, Bon Scott does um, Nanu Nanu, uh, Mork and Mindy. Um, again, I don't like this track as much as on ours, but it is a really good finishing track and one of the longest tracks probably the band ever did, 6 minutes 13. Um, it's got a really, again, disciplined groove, kind of going back to the ride on thing. Boom, boom. Um, you know, very, very, very good. Um, so, yeah, this is great. I mean, there was apparently, you know, rumours on a record company about Bon Scott, obviously his lifestyle, but was, was his voice right for radio? And I've, I've always had this thing, you know, sometimes you can't always tell what Bon's saying. Yeah. Whereas with Brian, even though he's got that screech, he can pick out the words, and that's a key thing for radio success, which radio, which this album started, but ACDC were, were to build on. So it's, it's hard to know what would AC, if Bond survived, what would Back in Black sounded like? Would Bond's vocal stylings be as commercial as Brian's? I know this is controversial. We'll just never know. It's just one of those great what ifs. Um, but Bond's legacy, any live footage you watch out or TV footage from that time, you see that he is, was one of the all time great Tiss Rock frontmans, the greatest for some. Uh, he's singing on this album, Stella. You know, it is not easy to sing Bond Scott stuff. And I think that would have taken its toll eventually. You know, he was kind of singing high and rawer. 
um, uh, on, on these, this material than he was back in his fraternity days. And you remember he's 33. Um, so even if he quit his drinking, you know, there's, it's one of those rod, rod for your own back vocals on a lot of this. The touch too much, like I said, I've not heard it. I don't know if DC did it live. Um, people can, uh, you know, um, uh, let me know on that. Um, but um, yeah, Tony Platt, great mixing engineer. Um, yeah, and you look at the charts on this, you know, um, it broke broke out in like a, a getting on for a dozen places, but crucially 17 on the Billboard charts and initially achieving platinum status, status and is now seven times platinum, platinum in the UK. Just looking here, it's, it's certifications are probably nearing about 8 million uh, and now you're taking the rest of the world, you know. Um, it'll be one of the, the biggest selling hard rock albums of all time. So yeah, probably my second favourite DC album after Power Age. It's a close run thing, um, but Power Age doesn't dip at all for me. Um, but um, yeah, okay, so Highway L, 45 years old today. I think this was one of the first cassettes we got, was one of the first, you know, hard rock albums I ever heard. A gateway album uh, into this brilliant genre. Okay, thanks very much. Remember to share and subscribe, and I'll see you again. Thank you.